Uh, hello, everybody. It's James here. Story time with Dutch Man Tell. We'll do some plugs very quickly. Of course, the world according to Dutch at Amazon. You can buy Good Tales one. from a Dirt Road from Amazon. Great you one. can buy. Which one's your favorite out of the two, by the way? Actually, the, I think the green one. Tales from a Dirt Road. Okay, well, there you go. If you're going to start off with one, start off with that one. And Owen Hart, King of Pranks that I have done. And The Rock, the People's Champion. Both on Amazon as well. Very highly regarded. If I do Let say me so ask myself. you something. How many pages in the Rock book? Jesus, there's a lot. Uh, a lot. It looks, it looks a lot. Uh, I don't know if you can see that there. Yeah, that's about 400 pages. Yeah. At least, at least. I'll, uh, I'll tell you, in fact, um, including... Oh, 346. It's the Owen Hart book that's over 400. Oh, really? Yeah. I'll tell you. I can't My book it. has, uh, it's almost, it's like 360. But your rock book with that you held up, here's ironic that the rock, when he was three years old, three, lived down the hallway from me in Nashville. And I saw him one time because he was like three. And uh, but that's where he lived with his father and his mother, which are his father's past now, but his mother's still alive. And he was his name was Dewey, because I used to ride a lot with, with Rocky Johnson, and he'd talk about Dewey. And I never formally met him, but I would see him in the hallway sometimes, and he was always scampering around out there in the hallway and I would open the door sometimes and see him, but good guy, really good guy. Mm. He came a long way. And did you know when he went to college or got out of college, I think he was broke. He had, he had like $25 to his name. I think he wrote this in one of his books. Seven, seven dollars. He was, that's what he had. $7. And then he, he explains how he got out of being broke because he believed in himself and he went after it. So now here's another question about the rock. I know we're supposed to answer questions here, but I think there's a big chance they may run him for president one day. You think so? Well, I think he'd entertain the thought. And I also think that I think he had a, he has a good chance of actually getting it because everybody knows him and they don't know anything about him. He was a Republican and I think now he's moved over to Democrat. Now that's not true. Uh, he was always uh, bipartisan publicly until 2019 where he uh, 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 made mention that he was supporting the Democrats for some reason or another. He appeared at the Republican convention but the thing is, uh, he also appeared at the Democratic event at convention as well that same year. The problem is, is that the Republican one was far better covered, and they had a far better publicity campaign than the Democrats. Well, the Republicans understand the beauty of the wrestling business. That's what I will say. Mm -hmm. The Democrats, on the other hand, I think they kind of look down on it as a downgrade from show business, almost like a carny sport. But, and we can say a lot of things about Vince McMahon, but Vince brought the wrestling business out of the National Guard armories. He bought them, brought them out of the high school gyms and brought them out of the car lot business. I mean, he used to have matches in the car lots for a promotional, but he brought them out of all that and put them in stadiums. And even though he changed the language somewhat, he didn't want them called wrestlers. He wanted them called sports entertainers. Well, that's all fine and good. People could live with that. But, uh, but he did a lot of things good for, for the business. But I'm saying uh, the Democrats kind of looked down on it. And I don't know if they still do uh, as a whole, but I think the Republicans embraced it. And I'm not saying which one I am, but uh, I guess you can imagine what I am. But it doesn't matter. I, I'm an American. I have that right. I can be one or the other. Mm -hmm. Now, liber talking about libertarians, that's the other party they have. That's a Kane party. That's a Glenn Jacobs party. 
And I used to ride up and down the road. This is another story I'm into. I used to ride up and down the road with Glenn, and we would talk politics. But Glenn, even though he wasn't a Republican and he wasn't a Democrat, he would talk the libertarian line of view, which is less government, which has a lot of upside to it. Has a downside. Everything has a downside too. And he would explain this, and he made perfect sense with what he was trying to, to tell me. You know who else is a liberta- uh, libertarian? Cool. Val Venus, mm-hmm. a big one. But you get Val talking politics, you're stuck. He's going to hold you where you are, and he's going to get his point across, and he's a very engaging speaker. You'll like him, even though you may not agree with him, but you will like him. So that's the only two libertarians I've known, but they are forcefully uh, energetic in their defense of their political views, which I like about them. Uh, one quote I heard from Jesse Ventura, which is still a very great quote, is you can't legislate against stupidity. So creating no, pointless yeah. laws, uh, yeah. the very specific ones, like I, I think he was talking about something like a snowmobile or some accident. But the thing about Jesse, and I met him in about three months ago up in New Jersey at another signing I did, but... Was he Republican or Democrat, or was he Libertarian? He was independent when he yep, ran for governor. Absolutely. And I used to, I never talked politics with him, but he made a lot of sense in just the things I read about him. And a funny story about Jesse, wrestling made him famous. He was, of course, he was always a great talker coming up through wrestling. He came through Memphis a time or two, and, and I work with him there. Not a lot. I probably work with him. He was there six months or eight months. Well, I'll probably work with him about 10 times, maybe. And he, he, he wasn't that great a worker, but he was a, an, an imposing presence with that voice. And he was a, a big guy. But the, the thing about him being on the ticket in Minnesota is when he ran for governor, is and who got him elected was wrestling fans. They came out of the woodwork in Minnesota to elect him, and it surprised the Democrats. It surprised the Republicans, and he got in there, and he actually did pretty well. You didn't hear of any scandals with him there, uh, and I think he was a pretty good governor. Uh, I think he got into a big tiff with some special forces soldiers. And did you hear about that? Oh, that's the Chris Kyle thing. Um, in Chris Kyle's book, he says that he punched a notable ex-Marine slash frogman, UDT frogman, in the face, but doesn't name him in the book. And then somehow it came out later, he was writing about Jesse Ventura, and Jesse Ventura has said that it never happened. And Jesse won a lawsuit. While Chris Kyle was still alive... Uh, he was he was suing, and then Chris Kyle was killed by a friend of his. This is American, the guy who American Sniper, yeah, uh, yep. uh, uh, was was based off. Of. And, but then he then he kept the suit going. He did. He sued. Uh, he sued the widow, but actually, I think the money was coming through the publishers or the publishers' insurance. Well, but anyway, I was, and and I met Jesse Ventura th- three months ago. I saw him again, and he came right up to me, Dutch shook my hand, hugged me, and I appreciated that because, you know, Jesse's going to look like Jesse. You could see him coming a mile away. And I guess with this mustache, you could see me coming a mile away too. But I, I was a very appreciative of him coming up and saying hello to me. And I'm sure if I'd have been at another part of the building, he probably wouldn't have tracked me down just expressly to see me. But very friendly, and uh, I, I, I enjoyed seeing him again. And I thought my view on him, whether he's Democrat or Republic, I, I can still appreciate his views and not agree with him. Absolutely. Um, well, we have some people who have written in for questions, as they always have. And the first one is Mark in Saigon, which I've actually Uh-oh. been to a few. A few and yes, so have I you. Have. <laughs> yep. 
I've you, been there. So what do you say? Well, it's funny. We've both been side gone in different decades and for different reasons. Uh, hi, guys. Love the podcast. Given all the talk recently of booking, I'd be interested in hearing what you think the requirements are for being a good booker and who you would consider to be slash have been one. Uh, well, anybody, let me, uh, I, and I've actually thought about this question. <clears throat> anybody can be a booker. Anybody. If you get somebody said, okay, you're the booker. You could be 14 years old and you can be a booker. And you said, all right, this is the first thing we're going to do. Dutch, you're, you're working with James. So tonight I want you to go in there and hit him in the head with a two by four and leave him laying. Okay. Boom. That's it. That's an angle. But the next week he's thinking, oh, now what do we got to do to follow up on that? It's not the first step. It's the second step. So I go in the ring and you say, okay, James, tonight Dutch is in a match. I want you to go in the ring and hit him in the head like he did you last week with a two by four and leave him laying. But now, guess where we are? We're back where we started. But that is booking. So the third week, we guys have a match and it's a double pull apart. We're still like where we were. Nothing has advanced. So. And then the fourth week, they put us in like street fight or whatever, but they've already seen it. But I mean, anybody can be a booker. It's the artistry behind the booking is what counts. So, and I think we talked last week about the angle between Matt, two names, Matt Riddle and Seth Rawlings. And if you, you told me in the email that I have been advocating, I like that word, advocating for this approach for, for months, and I have. They told a story, and now if creative doesn't get too aggressive and let it take its own natural course, because they book from pay-per-view to pay-per-view, basically. So the pay-per-view being the big show, what used to be what we'd say a big show, we didn't have pay-per-view years ago. We just went to a bigger building. So that was an upgrade. We could draw more people. We could make more money. That's what a, a pay-per-view is. And now they're, they're, they're booking like that, which makes sense. Now, where did I learn booking, making sense, and telling a story? Well, from Jerry Jarrett is one. He was the old Memphis booker, and he learned it from somebody, too. He learned it from one of the Fullers who owned the territory years before. And then Jerry Lawler took over, and I watched him too. It was a different style of booking, but both were successful. Like in Memphis, especially, Lawler would book six months, and Jarrett would book six months, which I thought was really a beautiful thing because they didn't have time to burn out. I mean, they had the same talent. All they did was just step in. And Lawler liked to book in the spring and summer. You know why? No. It's not it's not football season. Oh. <laughs> he's a huge he's a huge Cleveland Browns football fan, so he don't want to be bothered with booking and you know trying to run a territory during football season. He was he was too busy following the Cleveland Browns. And uh, I learned a lot from Jerry Jarrett. I learned a lot from Lawler because he learned it from from Jerry. I learned a lot from an old time booker named Tom Renesto, who was one of the original assassins who I used to actually, I was his driver and we would ride up and down the road, a brilliant man. I would talk to him, great talker. And, and he would tell me, I mean, he didn't teach me this, this, and this, he would just talk and I would have to piece in the pieces. I knew what he was talking about. Eddie Graham's another, and I think we covered this, last week or and some great bookers, Bill Watts, Bill Dundee is a good booker. And, uh, Ken Mantell, who's I'm not related to, he's the one who got Texas up and moving. You know how many George, questions I get? Sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. You know how many questions I get asking if you're related to Ken Mantell? Really? Yeah. I'm that's not. like the most asked question I receive. I never ask it. You. Well, I'm not related to him. And to add to that answer, he's called a plastic brother. See what I mean? I'm not really related to him, but I'm. But it's plastic. It's a name. Yeah, a plastic brother. So, 
but I'm not, I'm not related to him. I'm not related to actually Mantell, not even my name and Mantell's not even his name. His real name is Ken Lusk. <laughs> and my name is not Mantell. So we both got the names from, from, I don't know where he got the name. And, but, uh, I'm going back to booking, but Eddie Graham was a great booker. George Scott was a great booker. And uh, there's, there's probably been a few more. Buddy uh, Buddy, and uh, Ron Fuller, great, great bookers. But, but I think booking is not necessarily learned as it's like breathed. You breathe it. You kind of understand it automatically. It's storytelling. And using live play figures is what it is. And back in the days when I was actively wrestling, uh, if a booker gave me an interview, he wouldn't tell me to say this, 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 and this. He'd say, you're working with James Monday in a certain type of match. Go out there and sell some tickets. That's what he'd say. And I'd go out there, and it would be my promo about you, and I would make it as personal as I could then if you'd listen to it, you'd have to answer it. And then we'd, we'd do it like that. We did it the old time way. And I've never heard of a school for, I've heard of a wrestling school. I've never heard of a booking school because there is no such place. You can learn. It's like creative writing. If you can write, you can write, you can make grammatical mistakes and spelling mistakes but if you tell a good story, people overlook that. In their head, they're envisioning your story that you're telling, which is the same way with wrestling. You're just using live characters and a TV screen to tell your story. Mm -hmm. So booking is not that hard. It's common sense, basically. Tom Ernesto used to tell me years ago, uh, it's common sense. Don't jump. Don't do anything too far advanced for your audience and make it so a 10-year-old kid can understand it. Then you got a good story. And the difference, very quickly, uh, the difference between a booker and a writer is? Oh, t tons. A writer writes for a specific segment on TV. Writers aren't bookers. Bookers set, say, okay, we're doing, a, we're doing an angle between Dutch and James. We need an interview for James out here. Uh, he's going to face Dutch in some kind of match. Well, the writer, he, he, he pencils that out. It's the shits. You could do much better on your own, which is what I think Triple H is going to do now. He's going to let guys more or less, you know, like free rap. You know what free, free rap is? Freestyle. Yeah, freestyle. They, he's going to freestyle the interview because they're not doing it live most of the time anyway. They're doing it in the back. So let them, let them free rap it and see what happens. It can't be any worse than what some of those writers come up with. These writers don't even understand wrestling. They don't even understand being in a fight. And they don't understand this character would say this, but this character would say that. See, what I used to bitch all the time about, not bitch, bitch, like out in the middle of the hallway screaming. I said, give me the same writer every week. And no, no, because Vince disagreed with that. Because he said, if, if a writer can write for me, he can write for Kane too, or he can write for Undertaker, or he can write. No, he can't. It's a different mindset, especially my character. I mean, you could kind of get uh, the Kane's character, and you can kind of get Undertaker's character, what they will say and what they won't say. They're not, a, they're not men of words. They're men of actions. So, but... But, you know, Rock used to tell them, I'm not doing this. Or Stone Cold, I'm not doing this. That's, that's not me. And they'd go to Vince. Of course, Vince is going to agree with them. And I don't know why a writer would subject himself to coming in to a test of who's right and who's wrong with The Rock on one hand and Stone Cold on the other. Who's going to win? The money, people that are drawing the money, not the writers. They're expendable. Hell, they could walk out the door right now. But Rock and Stone Cold, no, they can't. So, but the writers, if you had the same one kind of writing, and all you need to write for these guys, they write for themselves. 
They do these interviews all day long in their heads, driving to the town, going to the town, in the rooms. They're doing an interview in their head. How am I going to get this rock? What should I say here? And they get it. They get in front of a mirror. You can tell rock. He's in front of a mirror. He's doing it because they understood that we're entertainers. I mean, we're physical entertainers. There's no other business like it in the world. See, stuntmen, they get multiple takes. We don't. We get one take, and if it don't work, well, it just looks like crap. And if it looks like crap, it's up to one of the performers to immediately seize that it looked like crap and keep going. It's a, it's a unique business. But, but a booker, getting back to my point, a, a booker lays the, the timeline out. He said, I want this to start here, and I want to kind of wrap it up at the pay-per-view. Except I never did that. I would take it at the start and I would put a big match here. Looked like it's wrapping up, but it didn't wrap up. I kept talking about it and then I would leave it alone for two weeks and come back to it because I always found out one thing fans do not forget. Why would you go from a sellout? These two guys sold out and you had a finish kind of ended it, but they're still interested in it. So why not restart it again and milk it for everything it's worth? And the fans will tell you when they're done with it. So just listen to the fans. Anyway, that, that's, that's my theory. No, I think that's three years worth of booking uh, advice and, uh, and education wrapped up in about 10 minutes there. So a lot of people do well to listen to that over and over again. Uh, the next question from Boring Dan. Could you describe what happened backstage between Samoa Joe and Kevin Nash? after Joe cut a shoot promo burying Scott Hall for no-showing the TNA Turning Point pay-per-view in 2007. Reports suggest that Nash smacked Joe so hard, he knocked him down, then smacked him again for good measure. Well, boring, Dan. You know, I, I don't think I could call myself boring Dutch <laughs> or boring James, but boring Dan has the cojones to say that, okay, here's my question. As a matter of fact, I can't answer that question because I was in attendance that day. I was in TNA, and I forgot what the actual setup was, but uh, Kevin Nash and Samoa Joe, and who didn't show up? What was his name? It was Scott Hall. He I, no show. I can't. I can't. Well, see, I forgot his name from where you mentioned him to now, <laughs> but anyway, but Scott Hall didn't come. Now, listen, we all kind of had it in our heads that, you know, maybe Scott isn't the most reliable guy in the world, but Kevin loved him like a brother, which will tell you why he acted the way he did. So we went out and they left it up to Kevin and I forgot what they were told to say. But they left it up to Kevin and Joe to kind to send out the message that something happened to Scott and he won't be here today. Well, Kevin did his part first and handed the mic to, he soft soaked it. He like soft sold it. Something happened or this, and well, Joe didn't do that. Joe went out there and literally scorched him on the mic and I'm watching from backstage or on the, I was around the screen backstage and I saw Kevin get over. He just eased over to one side of the ring and he's leaning on it like this. Like, you don't know what he's thinking, but I'm to myself. I'm thinking, nah, this is not going down too well with Kevin. So they leave the ring. Kevin didn't say another word in the ring. And I like Joe and I like Kevin. So they both come back and I wasn't there, but this is, I heard this about 10 minutes after it happened. Kevin walked up to him and it was like, you know, you have these big buildings, studio A, studio B, C and D. Well, they were out like in the middle of all four of them. And they had a little bit of a crowd around them. And Kevin just asked him, what the hell was that? And I think Samoa Joe, Joe, he said something like, well, he's not here. I'm not taking the heat from or something. I don't know what he said. 
don't quote me on that. And all of a sudden, Kevin just open hand slapped him across the face, which, of course, alerted everybody that, hey, this, this is, they don't, they're, not, they're not getting along down there. And I don't think he, he knocked him down. I didn't hear he knocked him down. But then he got up, and I think then Joe realized, hey, man, maybe I, I shouldn't have said it. And I, he may have tried to even tell Kevin he was sorry. He didn't realize that he came across like that. And he could have been legitimately sorry. And I don't know if he slapped him again. He could have. But that's, that's what I heard. But I think – and the re, and the reason I said that Kevin loved Scott like a brother, now we can understand his reaction to, uh, to what, what Joe had said. But I think it was left that day that Joe shouldn't say anything about <laughs> – uh, about Scott anymore on a live on a, on a live mic. So, and and that was the way it was left. Nothing else was said. Nothing else was done. It happened. We moved on. Uh, they both say that they're friends now. But uh, when that happens, and Scott Hall and knows possibly shows. possibly that's true. Yeah. Uh, when when that happens on the day, Scott Hall no shows. I mean, as you said yourself, you're half expecting him not to turn up. But, I mean, is your allegiance with Kevin Nash for defending his friend or is your allegiance with Samoa Joe for actually being truthful with the fans and lambasting Scott publicly? Well, I, I didn't have an allegiance. It was one of those things that happened. I can't say that Kevin was justified in slapping a co-worker. And I can't say that Samoa Joe was you know, was right in blasting Scott. It was one of those things that you don't foresee coming. And all of a sudden it's on top of you. So, but nothing happened to either one of them. I think they moved on. And as you just mentioned, they're friends now. I'm, yeah, I think they are friends because I think there's a, there's a lot of mutual respect between them. But at the time, Scott was really having a hard, hard time. And Kevin had worked really, really hard to get him into TNA. He actually kind of pushed for him and used his influence within the company to help Scott out because Scott, he made a lot of money, but he may have spent a lot of money too. Mm -hmm. And he may have needed to go back to work. And then all of a sudden, I don't think anybody felt worse about it than Kevin because Kevin was the one who went to bat for him. And then he left his friend hanging. And, but I think it's all water over the dam now. And so they're friends, so I'm glad for it. Let's move on then. And Engelbert asks, was it true that Jerry Lawler was trying to book himself versus Elvis Presley for the Mid-South Coliseum not too long before Elvis died? And are there any other celebrities other than Andy Kaufman that Lawler tried to book? Uh I'd heard the the Lawler uh, the Lawler and Elvis story, but that was about that was I think a year after I had left, and almost maybe a year or two, or maybe three years or four years before I came back. But I did hear that Elvis was a huge, huge wrestling fan, as was at that time everybody. In Memphis, if you didn't watch wrestling, you didn't know really what was going on. It was like one of those local events that everybody knew it was there. And whether everybody came or not, it's according to the cards you had. But everybody was more or less accepting of wrestling and, and respected it. And as far as him knowing uh, or having Elvis in a match, I think... I think I heard he had contacted Colonel Tom Parker, which was his manager. And I don't think the money was right because I don't think Memphis could, could guarantee the money that he would get in Vegas. I think that was the main thing. But I think if the money was there, I think we would have seen Jerry Lawler and Elvis in a ring either together or Against each other. I don't think we'd have, but Lana was a big, big heel then. 
So him booking himself against Elvis, I don't know what they would have done with that, but it would have been a it would have been a big big draw. If they'd have had pay per view in those days, I think they'd have done a hundred thousand pay per views hmm. just off Memphis. It's what I think. <laughs> uh, and but I did hear about it, and I, I think also that uh, Elvis was sick, very sick by that time, and he had a lot of problems. So, but. In answer to the question, I heard about it, and I wish they had done it or been able to do it because I would have liked to have seen it. Elvis would have had, depending on the month around that time, the weight advantage as well. So, and he had all he those karate have. moves. So you never yeah. know. I think Elvis would have blown up on the way to the ring. <laughs> and if you watch him late in his career, he was a profuse perspirer. He sweated a lot, and I don't know what that they they had to do his makeup a couple of times during the set because he would sweat it off. You know, a lot of things about uh, I'd, I'd heard about Elvis, and this is not wrestling, but Tom Parker took him to Vegas, and he was one of the first performers to sign an exclusive contract at a casino there. But he signed him at a price at later on. I think he signed him for four four years, three years three, four or five years, but the other performers started making more money than Elvis. Uh, Elvis was still out drawing them, but they were getting like a hundred thousand. He was getting 50,000. So well, that end said, he had a, I don't a know if, 50, 50, 50 split, didn't he? With uh, yep, the Colonel. They sure did. They sure did. And the Colonel knew what he had. The Colonel knew what, you know, what money box he had. Hmm. Uh, a 50 50, but the, and I don't know if the Colonel made him Elvis made himself more. I think it does. It didn't matter who had Elvis at the time. I think that Elvis would have been just as big a success with or without Tom Parker. I can't say for sure, but he was one of those once in a generation performers that doesn't matter what manager he had. He was going to make it anyway. Yeah. Definitely. Um, it's like me. It's like me and you, James. You know, we were <laughs> gonna. Somebody was gonna discover us somewhere. Yeah, we we are two once in a generation talents, I think. And I bet the people saying, "Thank God." <laughs> <laughs> we will move on. Uh, Shane mm. Krieger loved the show and Memphis Saturday morning shows are some of my fondest memories from my childhood. My question is, how was Austin Idol in and out of the ring? And any favorite matches or stories you have about? The Universal Heartthrob. I do. I was tagged up with him one time, and we were the champions of something. And we, they asked me one time, where did we win these titles? And in these days, you could just grab the shit out of the air. You just, I said, well, we won it in a tournament in Philadelphia or somewhere. Where? Well, you know, that building downtown, whatever. Who was in it? You know, a lot of people, you know. I just said we won it in a tournament in Philadelphia. And that's what Lance kept saying. Oh, they won this big tournament and became the champions. Well, there was no tournament. There was no match. There was no, well, there was a building. But we just made it up. But, uh, and me and Idol, we teamed up for about, I don't know, two months, maybe. And Idol is a weird duck. He is. Doesn't drink. Doesn't smoke dope, which was like a prerequisite back in those days, because that wasn't hard drugs. And he liked to travel alone. He did have a friend. He Lana was his friend, which tells that eventually I was separated from Idol. And then Idol came in, and Lana was a baby face. Idol came in every, I don't know, six months or so, and he'd stay two or three months, and then he'd leave. And he was one of those guys that I, I call the outliers. I talked last week about St. Louis being an outlier. Well, Lana used that too. He would book guys like Terry Funk and Idol, Dory, uh, Joe LaDuke, and he would come in for special shows. And that kept Lawler special, great booking, really. And it was smart booking, but he kept Lawler on top. 
and kept his friends. You know, he had his own group of guys, so they were loyal to him. But uh, but I seen a lot of times where he would book Idol, and Idol wouldn't show up. Oh my God, he wanted to kill Idol. And then he called up, well, I had a flat tire or did this, did that. It was one show. I mean, it would fly him in the afternoon, fly him out in the morning. But, uh, but Lawler kept him, kept him in that rove rock for a long, long time. He drew money. He, he did do that. But, but Lawler, as a, he wasn't a, he wasn't a, like a, a guy who was super friendly with everybody. He would come in and he'd have his own little dressing room. And I mean, I'd go in there and tell him, kiss my ass, or whatever, because I knew him. But most of the guys, I mean, he, he didn't have a lot of friends amongst the roster. I mean, everybody was friendly to him. <laughs> but as far as him like being one of the guys, he wasn't. Uh, with Austin Idol, is he somewhat of a trailblazer? Because he seems to be one of the very first people to do the uh, superstar Billy Graham sort of thing, you know, with the great body and the bleached blonde hair and everything. And mm-hmm. I think even The Rock has said that he stole some lines from Austin Idol. Yeah, he may have. But Idol was, yeah, he was a trailblazer in that regard. Uh, you asked another question in there. Was... Oh, well, I'll ask another one. Uh, did you ever hear the uh, story where he cashed a fake check for real oh, that's money? That's what I, that was, that was what I was going on. How <laughs> good. <laughs> this was in the Georgia territory and it was in the seventies. So they had this battle Royal and the winner got like $5,000. So they actually wrote him a check. For five thousand dollars, and presented it to him in the ring, and he took the check, he folded it up, and the next morning, and it was a real check. It was writ- written on the First National Bank of Georgia, or some whatever. He went down to the to the bank. And it was, and I don't know if it was written down. I don't know what his real name is. I forgot now. Mike what, McCord. What was his, I don't know if it was written out to Mike McCord. I think it was. I think. Or, but somehow he got the check cashed the next day. And then guess what he did? He left the territory. By God, who would have thunk it? <laughs> he took he took a bo- bogus check. It wasn't bogus. I mean, it was a real check. But to the fan, this is trying to keep K Fabe alive. They took the check. Here it is. And the camera got in on it, you know, and they did it for TV. And they give it to him. He took it. Thank you very much. I love you people. Blah, 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 blah. Hey, yo. He was doing all some idle stuff. Hey, yo. Blah. And he marched out, and everybody was happy. To the next morning, or probably to the next week, when those checks came in, the check statement, and they've had a check cash for five thousand dollars, and they tried to, <laughs> I think they tried to legally charge him with embezzlement or something, but guess what? In doing so, they would have to have, have they would have to admit that wrestling was pre-planned. And they weren't quite sure they wanted to do that. So he made $5,000. And that's a true story. Heck of a leaving present. <laughs> uh, we'll move on. Perry Horton. Uh, he emailed a few weeks ago. He emailed like 40 questions. Uh, but one of the things that he did mention that I thought was worth mentioning was your memories of Sugar Bear Harris, who we oh, yeah. better know as Kamala. Sugar Bear Harris. I walked in the dressing room in Memphis and I forgot what year it was years, years ago. And there was James. I called him James, but sugar bear, he was standing out in the hallway and I had, I'd known him. I'd known him from somewhere, you know, and we knew each other. I shook his hand. What are you doing? And he said, Oh man, I'm just, I'm just here to see if I get a job. I said, well, talk to Jerry, Jerry, Jarrett, Laura. So he walked in there <clears throat> and he walked out. And that night, I think he, he left before the, the matches started going. So I don't know how his little meeting came out. So, but 
and I was helping with creative in Memphis there for a while. So we went to the meeting, I think maybe a week later, and Jerry Jarrett brought him up. He says, what do you guys think about Sugar Bear Harris? And because he, he got the name by working for another group, an independent group down in Mississippi. He's from Mississippi. You know, I love, I, I love James Harris. So, and they, he's big. He wasn't a smart ass. He's a good guy, really. So they said, I have an idea about him. Now, in hearing this now, it sounds racist as hell, but it worked like a son of a bitch. They made him because Jerry Jarrett had just finished watching, watching a show, National Geographic. They still have it on. And they heard about this Dr. Kamala who went deep into the Amazon forest to treat these people with typhoid or, you know, some jungle disease or something. So they said, well, that'd be a good name. Kamala, the African something, I forgot. We'll call him Kamala. And they said, yeah, but we need to, we need to paint him up some. So, and as you saw him painted up, and he used this in Memphis, then later in Mid-South, he'd, he'd paint a half moon on his tummy, and then he'd paint something up, then teeth. Oh, and it was, and he got over like a son of a bitch when he walked out there, and nobody could beat him. He was about 330 pounds, but could move, and they did these this set of, Remember what I'm saying? Do things out of the studio. That's what, what they filmed him. It was supposed to be deepest, darkest Africa. Well, it wasn't deepest, darkest Africa. It was deepest, darkest Hendersonville, Tennessee. <laughs> it was right behind Jerry Jarrett's house. <laughs> and he's sitting down there and he'd hear some drums beating and he'd look around and, you know, he'd get up and go. So, and that's how they introduced Kamala. And they put a handler with him. I forgot what the handler's name. Kim Chi. <laughs> Which was Buddy Wayne, Kim Chi. <laughs> they put all this stuff and the face mask on him. You didn't know who he was. I think he ended up with Jimmy Hart. But, and he got over like a son of a bitch. So I, I remember the time he hadn't been beat and they booked him against Jimmy Valiant. And the place, I don't know if it sold out, but it was a hell of a house because Lala was in a match and he was blowing off an angle. He was getting ready for Kamala. So all the baby faces up to this time, it was the Fabs and Bill Dundee and Stan Lane. They'd all put Kamala over. So they booked him against Jimmy Valiant. And that was supposed to be, if he beat Valiant, he's ready for Lawler. But Valiant, something happened. He, he passed out at the airport, I believe, because he went to the hospital. I forgot what it was. So who took his place? Me. I took his play and I was fully expecting to get beat that night. So I walked in there with Jerry Jarrett and Kamala and he says, well, Dutch, you know, it, Jimmy can't show up. So you're picked. And I said, yeah. And I, I didn't mind putting him over. So he said, we're going to have you go tonight and uh, I don't want you to beat him. And I don't want him to beat you. I want like a double count out, which surprised me because that's like a draw. And I said, okay, so we did something. I ended up with a bull whip and, you know, he left, which a little, little more racism added in, but I didn't realize it at the time. But I asked Jerry Jarrett the week after, I said, let me ask you something. Why didn't you beat me like you beat the Fabs and Dundee and Stan Lane? Why didn't I get beat too? He said, well, you're your replacement for one thing. And you never beat a replacement because now the people are double pissed off. They double pissed off because uh, Jimmy didn't come. Then they double pissed off because you didn't do well. So leave them in the middle anyway. So he said, never beat a, a replacement. And he says, what you and Kamala did, it didn't hurt him. And it didn't hurt you. So he said, I think we, uh, we escaped that pretty well. I think he did come in the next week, Jimmy. And then they did, they, they, they did something. I can't remember what they did. But that was, and we talked about booking uh, like a week ago. That was one of the things that taught me never beat a replacement if you, if you can get, a, get around it. 
So it taught me a lesson too. But I remember Sugarberry Harris very, very well. Yeah, I believe Sugarberry Harris actually wrestled in England for a while uh, on the world of sports circuit or joint promotions, or whatever it was. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention about a- so- as Kamala. No, as, as Sugar Bear Harris or James okay. Harris. I think it was very early mm-hmm. in his career. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention that is another story I've heard is after a while of getting the stars and the moon paint, painted on his belly by Jerry Lawler, who did the painting, uh, mm-hmm. Sugar Bear would say to Jerry, uh, I won't do the accent, uh, Jerry, why do you keep painting a banana on my stomach? He thought it was banana all the way through. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> I, I don't know. That is a good question. <laughs> but at at the time, nothing seemed wrong. And to me, and see, I'm I, I say it's racist. It probably is. If you look at it under those lens, it probably is. But a lot of people, I mean, a lot of things used to be that way. But at the time, nothing was wrong with it. No black people. If you get in Memphis and no black people complain, you're not doing anything wrong. Hmm. So. We'll move on. Danish greetings from Danish greetings from Germany. Um, so, what I always wonder is how the old school generation of wrestlers think of today's business in a sense of kayfabe gimmicks and characters. I mean, I was lucky that I grew up in the golden age of wrestling in the late eighties, early nineties, but already at that time, kayfabe was dying. Back then, in Dutch's time, kayfabe was real. Fans were about to attack wrestlers because they would believe the characters. How do they feel nowadays when the wrestling business is more or less exposed and has rather only uh, and has rather only an artistic character. Well, I think that's changing. I think it is going back to the earlier days. We talked about it last week, the Matt Riddle and the Seth Rollins little vignette they shot in the, in the car park. You say car park? Yeah, parking lot. For I mean, most, most listeners' views are American, so. Yeah, parking <laughs> lot. And they told a story, and they understand that. Uh, they were turning it, they've been turning it off for years and years and years. Unless they had a tremendous story to tell. And I think now they're getting they're getting back to it. Kayfabe is a joke now. People, people say, uh, they use it in everyday language now. Carney talk. You talk, Carney? I try, no, I don't. You know, you know how it's yeah. how they speak it, right? Ism, I, I, yeah. I, I can never, I can, I know how it's, it works. I can't do it. You know where it came from? Well, the carnivals, I imagine. Well, uh, because when when one scam is going on and another worker at the carnival asked this other worker, the worker replied to him in Carney, which on a busy, you know, walkway showway, he wouldn't pick up on it right quick but if they could they could put the uh, i is you know whatever and i can't even speak i can't if i think about it but i never was that good at it the other worker could understand it immediately and take off so <clears throat> that's why that's 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 where it came from <clears throat> but we accepted that went on and i think now uh, the the downgrade of wrestling i mean the prestige of it is high basically because it's on all some major channels, it's on stream streaming now. It's, de- it's on paper. Been that way for years, but I'm thinking now, if they can get that casual fan to come back, they're right back in business. But the more fans you have, the more fans you're going to have on pay per view. I mean, because somebody said, "Ah, oh, it's thirty bucks. Uh, uh, let's get it." Hell, movies on Netflix is twenty. So if you're going to take a, just an original product and pay 30 bucks for it, yeah, then they'll get a bunch of people to chip in, and that's what they do. But And what was the question now? How has it changed? Yeah, I'll read through it again. Um, it's a lot to read through. Uh, back in Dutch's time, it would be, how do, how do you feel nowadays when the wrestling business is more or less completely exposed? Uh, same way, because it runs in cycles. I mean, it's always been exposed from the day I got in. I heard it as a kid. It's all fake. But then they say, but this one match I saw one time, they wasn't faking that. They damn sure beating the crap out of each other. You always get that. But I saw this match one time. They didn't fake it. And you always get that. So 
that goes back to my thought. If you could catch them in the, in that, you know, that zone between real or not real, uh, if you can again think that's real, that's all you got to do. And I think I've caught them in that zone a couple of times. WCW has caught them in that zone. WWE has caught it. Every territory has caught them in that zone at one point during their existence. And that's when they did the best. Absolutely. Uh, next one. Why WC Savior? Question. What was Tony Atlas like before and after he became homeless? Did you or other wrestlers know he was homeless right before he returned to the WWF as Sabah Simba? I recall Tony mentioning he matured a lot after the experience. Now, this is, I don't know, around 1990 or something like that. He was in WCW in the early 90s as well, I think. Yeah. Well, I know Tony fairly well, and he's never really, he's mentioned it to me. But I don't know why he became homeless or the circumstances of it. But I was glad to see him back in WWE as Samba Simba. What was it? Sapa Simba. I mean, I mean, if Kamala was racist, I mean, this one's just about, just about as bad. You know, it's, it's, a, it's the same thing. Yeah. It, it is. But it made him a living, gave him a home. I don't think he has any kids. And I think he's only been married once. But, you know, being homeless is not a good existence for anybody. But, and I don't know why he became homeless. I don't know if it was he just spent his money or he was on drugs. I don't think it was that because he's too much of a health nut, but he could have been. I think he was but, deep but, into drugs in the 80s, well, 90s. Well, maybe. I, I'd suggest that that's probably a contributing factor, definitely. Well, I, I know him fairly not that good, but I've sat at a couple of wrestling signings with him and talked to him. And good guy, funny, but he never really broached the subject with me, and I never brought it up. So I can't really answer that question truthfully because I, I, I don't know. I do know that his wife now is kind of sick, and he's kind of worried about her. Unless something has changed from last year to this year, it, I hope she hasn't passed away. But he, he did tell me she was very, very sick. So my – Blessings go out to him. Uh, with uh, Tony, um, I think it's sort of forgotten just how popular he was in the 70s. As you know, Black Superman Tony Atlas, he had the outfit on the whole bit, and they used to cart him around on a trail around town and say, come see this guy at the arena tonight, that kind of thing. Uh, when was the first time you met Tony? No, they did. No, they did. Oh, did they not? I don't think they did. I, I think he's told the story where like, you put him on the like, back of a trailer posing and stuff and say he's wrestling tonight, yeah, folks. I'd have to check that out because... I hope I've not made now, it up. Tony, Tony <laughs> is a little bit prone to embellishment. I will say that about him. That's what they used to do in the 30s and 40s. They would take him, you know, the wild man from Africa, take him around and... But I don't know if that happened to Tony or not. I may call him up and ask him, <laughs> did, they, did, did they do that? But uh, I, he's from Roanoke, Virginia, I think. And how he got in contact with the wrestling office, which was the Mid-Atlantic Territory, I think he won a, a posing contest. <laughs> he was cut at one time, and he's kind of tall. He's about 6'2". So they saw him and the hometown boy, and, and, and they took him around. So he actually, one of the very few guys who actually started on top. Because you can't put Tony Atlas in the first match. You just can't. He looks odd. And if you put him in the second match, you can't. Because none of those guys in the lower matches have any steam about them at all. So if you broke him in on top against a, a Greg Valentine who was over against the Ric Flair who was over against the Sergeant Slaughter who was over. And that's what I'm saying, being over by osmosis. He's just over compared to who he's, he's matched against. So, and I think he stayed there, I don't know, three, four months or maybe longer. And then I think he went to – WWF, and I think he stayed there. Him and Rocky Johnson teamed up for a while, right? Yeah, and the WWF Soul Patrol. Yep. 
They did that. And talking about that, that's racist too. The Soul Patrol, if you think back on it. I mean, if you think back on it, wrestling is no different than anything else. It was prevalent in the days, and that's when, you know, the Soul Patrol was, was hot and, you know, the, the, the black stuff was coming into existence. So, and I don't see anything wrong with it because they just followed uh, the social trends that were going on at the time. Move on that Joe shows. What are the worst wrestling rings you ever wrestled in? Once WWF. I swear to God, I've been on easier roads. I mean, it was, see, a ring is built. Here's a ring, you know, but in the middle, these guys are big. So I'm 300 pounds more. So if you get two, 300 pounders in there, you want that ring to give. So, and they didn't build them to give. They just put it like a big two by four to support it. So it didn't give. But if they had put that big spring in there, now you have a little bounce. So that's why you, and you remember the years past, you may not remember them, but they had WWF television. And they said it was the boringest TV ever. You know why it was boring? Nobody took any bumps. <laughs> they couldn't because they might not get up. They might just paralyze themselves by taking a bump. Now, if you want to fix all these problems or these crazy bumps in AEW, let Tony Khan get him a old WWF ring and put it out there and not tell nobody. You won't see the bumps like that. You won't. Well, you may see a few, but you only see a few of one guy and he's screw this. I can't take it again. But the old WWF ring, it was, it was patterned off a boxing ring. Boxing has no reason to give. And actually a giving ring in boxing is, is to the detriment of the fighters. You know, they jump and they're moving. They could throw a punch or other guys moving. His punch may land up here. It's not landing right here. So his punch is not landing where he's throwing it. But they were built along the lines of a boxing ring, which is which is not good. And they've been a few more rings here and there, but none of them were ever as hard as a WWF ring, ever. Next one, Courtney O'Brien. Hi, Dutch. Can I ask, has there ever been a wrestler who people have said that is a bad person backstage or a bad worker to you, but when you have met them, they are an entirely different person? Well, I, I, there's probably been a few. I can't recall any at the time. Uh, I mean, you hear things about your coworkers all the time, whether they're true or not. I mean, I've heard about guys who were like thieves who would take things out of your bag while you're gone. So when I heard that, I just, I just left my stuff in the car. So I wouldn't have a reason to challenge anybody for my, for my stuff missing. Or if I knew they would take things out of my wallet, I'd just take my money with me, put it in my, inside my sock, inside my boot. Therefore, I had it on me, and I never wore rings anyway, so I didn't have to put any rings or, or you know, necklaces or any stuff like that. But if I had money, I would, I would take it with me. I have on occasion, but, and I know what the question is, but I've never really, uh, and I read this question earlier today and I'm thinking, who have I heard was a bad person, but then I met them and they're not. Well, when you meet people, you know, you just, most of the time, if they're like bad people, how would you know? I mean, if somebody was planning to get something from them, they'd be kind of friendly, wouldn't they? Mm. So, but I, I can't answer, answer that question. We'll move on then. Stinky Pinky, uh, an apt name for an apt question. Did stinky, Memphis... stinky Pinky. Yes. Did Memphis have a large gay scene? Because so many of the early 80s video montages, <laughs> the fabulous ones, for example, come off as quite homoerotic. You think? <laughs> you... Gay Memphis did not have a gay scene. It didn't take... It doesn't take a gay scene to make a homoerotic <laughs> video, but I know what he's talking about. I'll be looking at the fabulous ones. 
And remember, I said you do things out. Of, I've said this twice already. You do things outside the studio. Well, that's what they did with Stan and and Steve Kern. They took them from Steve Kern and Stan Lane, who by themselves, and they will admit this, they couldn't draw a lot of money, but put them together as the fabulous ones, which was a takeoff on Jackie Fargo, the fabulous one, and let them do this kind of stuff, let them strut around. And, and the interview and the, the little vignettes they shot of them. Yeah. It was them standing like this. It was like, it, it was like uh, maximum male models. Hmm. You know, they're trying to do this. They're standing like this. And, you know, they were homoerotic, but they didn't aim them for that audience. They aimed them for women and young girls. And they tremendously over delivered. I remember going to a show with them about, I don't know, a spot show out of Memphis. It was about 80 miles out of Memphis. I like out of the way town. And the place sold 2,000 tickets in a little town with, I don't know, maybe 10,000 10, 10, population, maybe 12. They sold 2,000 tickets, but most of those tickets were like 60% female. And I remember they were selling what we call gimmicks. They were selling pictures, posing for pictures and signing them. They did more that one night than they did in their weekly check that they got from wrestling five nights a week or six nights a week. They made more that night just off pictures than they made for the whole week. So... It's that's got to tell you if pictures sell, they're over. So, uh, th and, and the homoerotic part, yeah, I look at it and I go, yeah, that's that's kind of gay looking, but <laughs> all I know is I made they made me money, so I don't care. I've, uh, I mean, aside from all the glamour shots of the early 80s that have made it onto the internet which some of them are hilarious. In fact, they're all hilarious. I mean, I think I've asked you this once before, but I'll ask it again. Is if someone, let's say Jerry Jarrett, presented you with a, a spangly top hat, a set of white gloves, and a thong, would you have put it on and uh, had some photos taken and sold them at the tables? Well, I'd have had, if, if he'd have told me to put it on, yeah, I'd have tried it. <laughs> but I, I would have made like a joke about it. But see, you can make a joke about it and get by. If you take it seriously, that's when you run into trouble. If, if, if you take that, that, that gimmick seriously. And I had something else I was going to say, and I forgot totally about it. What did you say before? Uh, the glamour about, shots. I'm trying to think what else I said. Glamour shots and would oh, you have oh, taken I know a photo? What I, I've got some shots I'll send you. Oh, God. <laughs> no, and these are not glamour shots. These are like Playboy shots without total nudity. I remember that Lawler took one where he just covers up his little mm. wing wing. Dundee took one where they're laying like this. And I'm thinking, I don't know if I could do that shot, but women loved it. Now, this is what I thought about sometimes. A guy's married and he wants to go to wrestling and his wife doesn't like to do anything else with him, but she'll go to wrestling with him. So that's what she enjoys. He thinks, but why does she want to go to wrestling? Because it's male burlesque, exactly what it is. And he can say, "Oh, I hate that son bitch," and she's thinking, "Wow, you're not you're not looking at what I'm looking at." So, but and there's been a lot of stories about some wives coming with their husband to the matches. Then all of a sudden, she gets up to take a little bathroom break. And she's gone about 20 minutes. Well, she could have slid outside very easily and had a little skedaddle, as I call it, and go back in. And a lot of guys never knew the difference. I never told them. I knew about some of them, but I never told them. And it keeps them coming back <laughs> for more. Oh, yeah. They, they, they love that. <laughs> uh, well, we've probably got time for about two more, maybe. At Solid as Snake, we've heard a lot of stories about Alberto Del Rio as a person, but what is Dutch's experience with him? Also, without Vince, can you see a future collaborations between WWE, AW, and New Japan? 
uh, are, as we're seeing with AEW and NJPW. I think the interesting question is the uh, Alberto Del Rio as a person. Well, to me, he was he was good, great guy. But get him drinking, he changes. But that's just not Del Rio. That's a lot of people. You get them drinking, and all of a sudden, they kind of morph, change into another person. And in Del Rio's case, uh, Alberto's case, he'll probably tell you the same thing, that when he drinks, he gets aggressive. And he does. I remember one night we were in Germany, and he shows up with a black eye. And since Jack was working with him almost every night on that tour, so I saw him every night personally up close. I said, what happened to your eye? And he said, and he's telling me this story. And he said he was in this bar, and this guy got kind of physical with this girl, and he called him on it, like, hey, man, don't do that. He like he shoved her back or something and he said hey man don't do that and they had words and the guy took his glass mug and hit him right in the face with it he said he brought some blood and left him a black eye and they got into it and i guess they threw them both out but a fight didn't happen over it i think maybe del rio may have got a punch in before they all jumped in but uh but would he have done the same had he not been drinking? I don't know. He may not have even been in the bar had he not been drinking. I mean, what, what's the purpose of going to a bar is is, is strength. But to me personally, he was always a, a, a really good guy. And when he was not drinking, great, great guy. Uh, did you? I, I know you, when Vince's mind is made up, it's made up and there's no talking him around. But did you ever broach with anybody in the office? why you should not have been Alberto Del Rio's manager. Yeah, I did a lot, but not to Vince. Cause they were afraid <laughs> to go to him with my, you know, apprehension. You like that word? Mm -hmm. I just pulled out my, my fears about it didn't make sense. Yeah, it didn't make sense. The only one it made sense to was Vince. It's his idea. Vince loved the Zeb Coulter character. He loved it. He used to like when I said, oh, you're, you know, you're teetoing across the border. Sneaking, sneaking across the border. Oh, he loved that. And he loved for me to say Alberto Del Rio's name, but the way I would say it, Alberto Del Rio. I'd roll that R. Oh, he loved that. They, they'd always tell me, whatever you do, do the name. That he pops every time you do it. So of course I'm gonna go out there and I'm like the little puppet on the string. I'm gonna <clears throat> I'm gonna say the name. And, but I brought this up on other interviews. It did not make sense, not in any context, not even a wrestling context. It didn't make sense because I lay off. And this is when I had surgery and I broke my leg. That's coming back. But it didn't make sense on on any level but it did defense. So how do you tell him it doesn't make sense? And I've said before, I had the perfect angle to come out of it, but it never got that far. So we dropped it. Then I went home forever. <clears throat> no one's asked me this, but I don't think I've asked you this. Uh, why did you go home forever at that point? Did you leave? Did they dismiss you? Uh, what happened? No, they just, they just didn't have anything for me. So they extended my contract for, I had a three year contract at good money, and I was going to get paid the money regardless. So when I went home, uh, my money kept coming. So, and then they, the guy that they fired, uh, Carano, what was his first name? Mark. Mark Carano. Carano. And he was a head of talent relations. And he called me up and told me they weren't going to, you know, renew my contract, which is fine. I mean, I knew how, how many times have I said you'd get hired, they get fired. I've, I've said it three times in two weeks. And he come up very nice. I mean, and what was I going to say? Why, why are they doing it to me? It's, it's a business. And you expect to, 
yeah, I'll sign this if you'll give me this. And then when you're tired of giving me this, let me know. And if I don't have any issues, we'll part company. There's a thing about being professional about it. So I was professional. He was too. And uh, they let me go because I was still having trouble with my, with my leg. I actually came back too soon. I should have went ahead and had the surgery sooner, but I didn't. And, but my money continued for, I don't know, another two or three months. So when you're sitting back and you're making money, you're going to enjoy it as long as it's going to last. Then guess what? The damn check stopped. Damn them. I can't. That's what I was mad at them for. They stopped paying me. So even though they, they, if they'd have kept paying me, I'd have been, you know, I'd have been six months over my date anyway. But I enjoyed them booking me. I got booked at a time when most guys are event, uh, essentially resigning. I think I'm the oldest guy they ever hired and the quickest guy they ever hired. I think I own two distinctions there. And I was very, very uh, appreciative of that because they don't hire guys over 45, 50. And hell, I was 10, 12 years past that point. So they had to, and, and guess who hired me? Triple H. Mm -hmm. Triple H, I think it was his idea, our road dog's idea for Swagger to get a, 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 a talker, a, a mouthpiece. And I think uh, Triple H was probably a main proponent of it. And I always appreciate him for that. So, I, and I like Triple H and I, I wish him the most success in the world. And uh, look who's back in power, Triple H and Road Dog. So you might be getting a call uh, any week now. Well, I doubt if I get a call because I couldn't do it. But I would contribute ideas because ideas, they can get a lot of people to play an, a character like me. You just got to be coached a little bit. So, but, and I'm the perfect coach for it. So, and even, you know, even after I left WWE, people would come up to me and it says, I never liked you too much. I said, well, I don't know why. He said, well, because you're an asshole. I said, why you say that? Because those things you said. I said, what things? You know what you said about this, that, and the other, or whatever. And I says, brother, and I told them the truth. I said, man, they wrote that down for me to say, bullshit. You said that because you believed it. Again, going back to my point, you get them in that never, never land. They don't know what's true and what's not. You got them. I could have took this guy for a long ride that day, except I didn't have time and I wasn't in a, a frivolous mood. So I said, well, whatever you believe, but a lot of people believed that I really, uh, I really believe that it's, did I believe some of it? Some of it. I think a lot of things, the political people believe they can believe the same thing, but in varying degrees. So in believing in the same thing, no, they don't believe the same thing, but close to it, but they still going to argue about it. Uh, I think we've got time for just one more question and I've got four to choose from. And do you know, because we've not talked about him really and I thought it'd be nice to, Julius McNeil, hey Dutch, hope you're doing good and I love your work and think you uh, you are one, he's missed several words, one of the best wrestling minds. I'm a big Kane fan and I read in his book that book him in, I read him how they've written, what can I say? Yeah, you booked I know, him in I, Puerto I read Rico, it. what was it like yep. and do you have any good stories with him? Yeah, I booked him in Puerto Rico. I've told this story before. I met him on some independent show in Southern Indiana, and I've never seen him before. And I was looking at him. I went, damn, what a big guy. What a body, you know? And I'm thinking, well, he's tailor-made for WWE. I mean, you could you could look at him and tell him he needed seasoning. He needed experience. <clears throat> and at the time, I was going to Puerto Rico. And I told him, I said, listen, uh, I'm going to Puerto Rico. Give me a call if you want to try it out in there because I can use you down there. I told him I was going to take over the book. And he said, okay, thanks. And, uh, and I forgot, he just kept working independent shows and working a job. And so finally one day he called me down there and he says, uh, do you think you have room for me? I said, yeah. And I give him, I give him a guarantee, which I didn't give the other guys didn't have, but they had Puerto Rico had a, a history of not paying guys. And he knew this a little bit, but I didn't amplify it any more than what he knew. 
then I had him coming in, say, on the 10th. Well, he calls me on like the, the second or third and told me that he was concerned <clears throat> about coming down there because he had heard some horror stories coming out of Puerto Rico. And they were horror stories because some guy not get paid. Like, uh, what was Sonny's guy's name? What was Chris Candido? Yeah, Candido came down with, with her. And they ended up living on the beach homeless. I'm thinking, what the hell? And he had heard that. So I told him, no, come on. I'll make sure you get paid. Now, could I make sure he got paid? Well, I could maybe put up a stink and maybe get him paid, but I couldn't really guarantee him. But I told him I could. And I was going to do it if I had to take my own money and pay him because I had promised him. So he came down. Everything worked out fine. And I was glad that he was there because one night we pulled into the show and I had worked this hot angle on TV and I could tell by the people, by the way they looked at me, not at Kane, but at me, they were frigging pissed at me. I forgot <laughs> what I'd done, but I'd done something evil or vile that day on TV. And they wanted to see me, you know, put in my place and cart it out. And that night, brother, I did this deal where, I had a riot and I was trying to make it back to the ring and to the dressing room and they cut me off. I went one way, couldn't go the other way. I couldn't go. It had like a little fence with little gates in them and they were, just, they were all jammed. So I finally made it through with my manager and they were beating the living shit out of us. Him too. So I remember somebody tripped me. I went down and I got a big kick right here in my face. Bam. And boy, my eyes started swelling up and it started bleeding. Now I'm fighting these four guys trying to, I could see the door. I said, if I could just get to the door, I'm okay. And the guy was hitting me in the ribs, not hit me in the head so much, but hit me in the ribs. Oh my God. I mean, they wasn't deadly, but they were hurting. And I remember the door opened and there stood Cain. And now all the guys looked up like this. We was probably pretty close to him then. And I looked up like, thank God. And he took a step toward, toward us and they went, Whoosh! and he grabbed me by the arm and pulled me in and closed the door. If it hadn't have been for Kane, I think I, I'd have been in for a worse shot that night. That's when I went to the hospital and Glenn went with me. Glenn went with me and my driver. We went to two hospitals that night. And I got home about six o'clock in the morning. I'm not home, but I got back to my room about six o'clock in the morning. But without Glenn that night, they'd uh, beat the living crap out of me. So I appreciate him being there. And I've told him too. And I told him in my book. Um, <clears throat> with Kane, did, did you create a character for him to come to Puerto Rico like you did Abyss? Yeah, well, I did uh, Doomsday. Is that the I Mad Max Doomsday's sort of thing? No, but he was like a, a monster type guy. I got some pictures of him. Doomsday, I, and I think I just took the mask off of him. It was like a, what movie did you name them? Mad Max, Max Road Warrior. Uh, you know, that golf, that the gimp the goalie thing. mask. Oh, right. The goalie. Yeah, I took that off. And, but he learned to work there. I kept him down there nine months. And then I put him in contact with Jim Cornette. And Jim Cornette brought him into Smoky Mountain. And I think uh, Eddie Gilbert was there. He wanted to bring him together. But Eddie, something happened. He didn't go there. Actually, he came to Puerto Rico. And then, and there's a whole story about this too. But, and then Kane went on. Uh, he went to the dentist part. He went to Scott Hall impersonator or whatever, yo. And then he ended up as Kane. So it worked out good for him. The Eddie Gilbert thing, it didn't work out so well because when I suggested to Carlos who could be the next booker, I told him I didn't know. He said, well, what about Eddie? And I was going to suggest Eddie, but I didn't. And I'll tell you the reason why was because Eddie did have a drug problem and they sold uh, like Percocets and Lord tabs. They sold them. That's an opioid. They sold it over the counter, didn't have a prescription or not. You could get it every day if you wanted it. But I told him, I said, well, I would suggest that, but I think it might be a bad idea. 
And he said, will you call him? I said, no, I won't call him. You can call him, but I'm not going to call him. And so Cardis called him, give him a deal. So I lay up, Eddie came in and three weeks later, Eddie, I get news that he had died in his hotel room. So, but could I change it? No. I mean, free, God gives us free will and that's what he was utilizing. So, but I hate it. I really, cause Eddie was a good guy. And yeah. that's in my book too. My next new book. Book three. Book, book number three, Trace, Trace. Oh. Libro, Libro, this is my Spanish. Mm -hmm. Libro numero tres. That's pretty good, I thought. And when's it coming out? When I finish it. <laughs> whenever whenever that is. Well, have you, have you got like a schedule for it or a goal, a date in mind that you might get it out for? Maybe for Christmas. Perfect time. I hope so. I hope so, maybe. But don't, don't you know, you know me better than most don't hold me to a deadline because mm. you know i said well i don't feel good today or this that the other i mean i make it up but i'm bad on deadlines but it will be a very interesting book because in in this book i'm going to cover my early years nobody knows about that i've never been freely you know talkative about it this will be about my uh tna years kind of then my WWE years and my experiences there. So it should be, should be a decent book. And if you can't wait for the third book, there are two more books that Dutch has got already, Tales from a Dirt Road, and I can't remember the name of the other one. The World According to Dutch, I just looked at it. Yep. It's on the floor. I can't reach it at the moment. But uh, they're both available on Amazon. And if you want them signed? Uh, you can just email me at Dirty Dutch Mantel with two L's. At gmail.com, tell me what you're looking for, and I'll get, I get back and contact you right away. There you go. Uh, only other things to say, if you enjoyed this podcast, please give us five stars on iTunes, where else you can rate us five stars. If you didn't, uh, keep your opinions to yourself. And I think that's pretty much it. So thank you very much. Do, do, do we have a join or a subscriber list, or do we do that? A sub oh, like to email people. No, we don't. Uh, I, can, I can message people indirectly through youtube like it's got like a message board internal message board so are you thinking for uh when the book comes out announce it well yeah but i've seen subscribe I, listen i'm the dumbest son of a gun when it comes to internet or anything but i see this please subscribe subscribe to what what am i going to get if i do subscribe what do you get well, if you subscribe to Storytime with Dutch Mantel on YouTube, you get daily Dutch content in the form of clips and you get the full episodes as well, I think six days after they come out on the audio podcast. So uh, all the Dutch all the time is what you get if you subscribe to Storytime with Dutch Mantel on YouTube. So that that's a your deal. Yes. That's a, that's a your thing. Okay. Just wondering. I'm just... Sitting here trying to learn as I go, so <laughs> well, don't ask me. You just told me that you, or you told me before, and that you've never actually seen a clip or a full episode of the ones we've done. No, I don't watch myself. Mm. I mean, it's like me going back and reviewing what I'd said in the car the night before. I go, oh my god, why did I say that? What? To I mean, I mean, I have to, or I did have to. I've got an editor now who who helps me out with some of these things, but. I I've gone through quite a lot of the clips and just listened to what you've said. I mean, I put up with me to get to what you've said, so I'm interested enough to listen to it a second time. Well, it's it's, it's good information. Mm. I mean, it's you're hearing it from the same thing I heard. I don't embellish nothing, and I try not to knock people. You know, I try to keep my my other you know dalliances to a minimum, so I don't tell people like you know I'm uh, I'm alcohol. Uh, did I say alcoholic? I, I don't keep that. I keep that to myself. I don't let that out. But, but sometimes, you know, I think people that enjoy this wrestling stuff, I'm talking to them like I'm talking to you mm -hmm. or like I'm talking to another wrestler. We all kind of understand it and everybody uh, understands that it's my opinion. And, and if people say, well, why did you say that? Well, when it gets to that point, well, we can part company because it's my opinion and I'm going to keep my opinion to myself unless you want, I mean, I, I'm going to keep my opinion the same, whether you say anything or not. But I think that's, that's the beauty of listening to it. I think they understand it. And I think they understand 
See, you're different than different uh, hosts because some hosts over talk their guests. Some hosts just keep throwing this and this and that. I don't want to hear the host. I want to hear the guy. So I, but I, and I think a lot of people get enough of me here. So they may not want to subscribe. <laughs> maybe, maybe I not, may not want to see that number. Hey, we're getting hundreds every day still. And also, uh, and I've said this a couple of times before and probably said this to you, is I agree. It's like no one's, no one's tuning in for me. I can only ruin this show. So the best thing I can do is ask a question and then sit back. Okay. That's it. Did we tell them what it says on a U.S. Uh, immigration form yet? No, we didn't. Uh, we had a look and um, do you want me to actually find the full list? No, we'll do it next time. We'll do we it tell the people. No, what, what it's about, folks, is James was telling me, I said how hard it was to get into Canada. He said, get into Canada. You should try to get into the U.S. I said, what? He said, I've answered questions there that I've never seen anywhere else. So he started asking me, he said, have you heard this? The question is, if you're a U.S. visitor trying to get into Canada, have you ever, are you a terrorist or have you ever belonged to a terrorist organization? Now, I never heard that before in my life, and I did not know it said that. And then it says, what does it say? Or Are you an activist or are you what? Well, uh, do you belong to a clan or tribe? Uh, have you ever been a drug abuser? <laughs> have you yeah. ever, in- are you coming to the United States to engage in prostitution? I mean, that seems to be fine. <laughs> um, espionage, sabotage, export control violations, or any other illegal te- uh, activity, terrorist okay. organizations, genocide. Does anybody... Does any has anybody ever heard of this or read about it? Because I haven't. So anyway, but we'll talk about it a little more next week. For now, I mean, I tell you, that'll stop me from coming to America again if I have to fill that bloody form in one more time. But no, I'll I'll probably be in Florida at some point. They've got some. Uh, I mean, they've got you there. They've got a. Uh, uh, they've got a lot of uh, theme parks as well, which I'm a big fan of. Well, if you come to Florida, then we'll ask you that. You say, "Well, Dutch man tells here." I don't know how he got in. He's a citizen, but he don't answer these questions, so I'm not either. And they say, okay, we're just kidding you. Go on in. So, <laughs> But anyway, we'll see, we'll see everybody next week, right, James? Right. We will see everybody next week. I Usual time. For, you know, I never give the times out. So 1 p.m. on Fridays is when this podcast comes out. I thought it was 8 o'clock. Sorry. Right. 1 p.m. GMT, 8 a.m. Uh, Eastern time. Yeah, There's okay. all these bloody time zones that I have to deal with. I've never gotten wrong. I've never missed an interview with it yet, but uh, I'll figure it out. But uh, yeah, for now, thank you very much for watching. We'll catch you again next week. And thank you, Dutch, for entertaining us once again. <laughs> we the people. Got it. <laughs>